really in the last month or maybe two months has really stuck out to me, particularly verse 7. And so I thought we'd really go over this today. So Psalms 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the name. I said 112. Yeah, 112. Did I say 12? Yeah, right, sorry. 12. That would be a different place. <laughs> Praise the Lord, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land, the generations of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God. Hear it, believe it, live it. You may be seated. Are you afraid? It seems like there's more and more things that we ought to be afraid of anymore in our day. And our question is today is how do we deal with these fears? And I'm going to make the point that it is the fear of the Lord that relieves all other fears. Now, some of you may say, well, how does that really help me? Okay, I'm not afraid of this, but now I'm afraid of the Lord. Um, and so we're going to look at that in a second. But what are you afraid of? And we're all afraid of different things, right? Some people are really afraid of COVID-19, or at least think everybody else ought to be. Some people are just afraid of death in general. Cancer, old age... Having your sins found out, losing loved ones, right? There's lots of different things that we may be fearful of. And there are some things that I might be afraid of that you are like, why would anybody be afraid of that? And there's some things that you may be afraid of that I'd be like, why would anybody be afraid of that? And there are those different aspects to fear, right? And some fears we might say are rational, and some fears we would say are irrational, right? Sometimes we talk ourselves into being afraid. My kid is late, is 10 minutes past his curfew. He is probably dead on the road someplace, right? That is an irrational fear, at least hopefully. But then there are real fears. The doctor says you have stage four cancer. You're probably going to die. That's a real thing, isn't it? And so we deal with those things. So what do we do about these fears that we have? I mean, it's just part of the human condition. It's things that all humans deal with. And what we're going to look at today then is how the fear of the Lord reveals all these other fears. And I broke it into two parts. First one is we're going to look at the nature of fear. Okay? Just how fear works, how we as people are fearful, and then secondly we're going to look at and define for us a little bit the fear of the Lord. And then we're going to look at three characteristics of people who have the fear of the Lord. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. So, the nature of fear. The first thing is right to talk about is human fear. Right? And, and we certainly understand fear as a feeling, right? We've all been there, right? I used to be much more afraid of heights than I am today, and I could be quite chicken-hearted up there. And you know, your your heart starts pounding and you just get to where it's like you can't even move, right? Or think or make a decision. Um, so there's, we understand perhaps the feelings of fear. There are people who, who struggle with anxiety attacks, right? That, that's a big thing where they just become, in a sense, paralyzed with fear. And then there's just, when sometimes we just make decisions based on fear. Maybe we're not to the point of having panic attacks or things, but we make decisions based on fear of people. What will everybody think about me if I do this? And that's a good way really to think about fear, particularly if we're going to compare human fear to the fear of the Lord. Because 
when we the fear of the Lord, people who have the fear of the Lord make decisions based on what God thinks. People who have the fear of man or anything else make decisions based on what other people think. I like this quote from Patrick Henry. He said, Fear is the passion of slaves. Isn't that true? What keeps people in bondage? <coughs> fear of what happens if I revolt. Right? What is a tyrant's most used weapon? Fear. If you do not do what I want you to do, then this is what's going to happen to you. You even see some of this with the elections, right? There was things where people were sending stuff out, threatening people. They had certain signs in their yards, you know, I'm going to burn your house down or something. Right? Fear. We use fear to manipulate. And, of course, this makes sense coming from Patrick Henry that he say that because it's the same man that says, right, give me liberty or give me death. Right? In other words, I may die if I revolt and refuse to take slavery, but I won't be a slave. And I do think fear keeps us enslaved to sin. And I think fear can drive us to commit all kinds of sin, right? Fear of telling the truth about who I am or what I struggle with, what will people think about me? Will they think I'm this horrible person? Of course, the reality of it is God already knows, or really, and that's the problem, right? We don't really put enough value on what God already knows and what He says, right? And these are things we all struggle with, even me as a pastor, right? You can struggle, like, as a pastor, I tell somebody to struggle with this, what will they think? Right? Because pastors are supposed to be perfect in every way, shape, and form, because it says so somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> right? Those are things we deal with, don't we? We deal with fear. We deal with the fear of who's going to win the election. Is my candidate going to win? But we have to be careful with fear. Because as I said, fear can drive us to do all sorts of sinful things. And I think the example of King Saul is the perfect example. Right? And I'm not going to turn there, but right, we see that Saul perverts justice because of fear. And he preserves, right, because after David kills Goliath, what does Saul do? What, what, is, what do the people do? What do they sing? The ladies sing songs about Saul and David, right? Saul is slaying his thousands, but David is ten thousands, and King Saul hears that. And not only is he maybe a little jealous, he's like, what more can they, he have but the kingdom? Saul knows the kingdom's supposed to be taken from him, and here everybody loves David. So David's coming for me. And that perverts justice. Why? Because King Saul spends pretty much the rest of his reign, right, chasing and trying to King David, who has never been anything but loyal to him. That's not justice, is it? That's not fair. And of course, if we look at the psalm, Psalm 12, we even see, right, um, in verse 5, it is well with a man who deals generously in lens, who conducts his affairs with what? Justice. Justice. Not out of fear. Not out of fear, but out of a realization of who God's character is and that justice comes from God and is part of His character. Not afraid of what poor people will think. Not afraid of what rioters will think. Not afraid of who the governor is, what he's going to think. Afraid of what God says. And submitting Himself to that. Because as we see in the beginning of Psalms 12, it says, praise the Lord. But He says, blessed is the man who fears who? The Lord. So you are blessed when you fear the Lord, not these other things that King Saul deals with. Saul lies to cover up sin. Right? Remember, Saul was supposed to go out and wipe out the Amalekites. And he sort of did. And so Samuel comes and says, Saul, you didn't do what you're supposed to do. And Samuel said, yes, I did. Samuel was like, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Right? And they got this back and forth exchange. And we're going to go here. We're going to go to Samuel. 15. And so they're, they're going back and forth, and Samuel finally gets the betterment of King Saul. Now I'm going to pick up in 22. 
this is Samuel speaking, and Samuel said, Has the Lord a greater delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is, an iniqu is as iniquity and idolatry. Because, if you, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. And just for a note for later, the word of the Lord is eternal. So Saul has rejected the eternal word of the Lord for what? Well, Saul finally comes clean here in verse 24. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice instead of the eternal word of God. Right? I mean, he doesn't say eternal word of God, but that's, right, that's who he, he admits to. Fear drove Saul to cover up his sin. And Saul was more afraid of the people than he was of God. And we could even see that this ultimately leads to denying Jesus and to denying God. Now, Jesus hadn't come yet, but we see Saul right here. Samuel says, to disobey, I mean, that's like committing adult idolatry, which is what? Worshiping another god except for God. And we see this take place when Saul goes to the um, medium, the witch, in 28. And of course we see an example of this with Peter. Right? Fear causes him to do what? Deny Jesus at the cross. So fear, certainly of the wrong things, can drive us to commit all types of sins. And also a fear of other people discovering our sins will cause us to commit lots of other sins to cover it up, won't it? That's just the nature of fear, isn't it? Instead of just coming clean. Because we're afraid. And here's the real sad part is that fear is what ultimately keeps us from freedom. Isn't it true? Fear is what keeps us from freedom. The freedom we find in confessing our sins. And Satan is a mastermind of using fear in manipulation. You know, especially... Um, now, we'll move on from here. So, we have now the fear of the Lord. So, that's human fear, right? Something that we're all very familiar with. So, how is the fear of the Lord different? Well, as, you know, I could go back in Psalms 12. Now, Psalms 111, it is interesting because Psalms 112 really picks up from Psalms 11. And, of course, the end of Psalms 11 says that... The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And then, of course, Psalms 12 comes in and says, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord. Okay, and that starts naming characteristics of this blessed man. So, I think it's important to understand, though, that the fear of the Lord starts off as real fear. Real terror. Why? Because it starts with this. A realization that I am a sinner. And I have made God very upset with me. And I deserve God's judgment. It's not even that God is just mad at me just because. No, I deserve God to be mad. I deserve to go to hell. And I deserve that to happen right now. In fact, every breath I get is a blessing from God. Because I should be finished and in hell now. And so that would create real fear because nobody is more powerful, nobody is more awesome, and nobody can inflict greater penalty than God. So it starts, now here's the key, it starts with real fear. But it moves on from there. And the reason it moves on from there is because we, one then realizes that God sent Jesus to die for you. That Jesus took all that wrath that God had aimed at you, and he took it upon himself. And then Christ gave you his righteousness. So that when God looks at you, not only does he see you as not guilty, he sees you as somebody who has done everything right. Because he sees you as Christ. And Christ did everything that was right. So it moves, but there's still always a lingering bit of fear in this sense. Awesome all. Right, when I went to Niagara Falls this summer, 
And I was on the boat, we did the, you know, the Maid of the Mist, and you're right there, and you have all that water coming down. And you are as safe as you reasonably can be, right? But there's still this something inside you that's almost a little fearful, isn't it? Because of just the might and the power. Now you take God who is so much more mightier. The man, the, take the God who created Niagara Falls. How much greater sense of awe and wonder and healthy fear would you have? And the fear of the Lord, the reason now, why, why would the fear of the Lord, though, be considered the beginning of wisdom? Because also when we come to the fear of the Lord, we come to a place of humility. Because we now realize that God is this. We realize that God has created the world and all that is in it. Which means he what? Knows everything. And so we're then going to submit our hearts and our minds to the Lord. And I like this definition in the MacArthur Study Bible. It says, the fear of the Lord is a state of mind in which one's own attitudes... Will, feelings, deeds, and goals are exchanged for God's. Because the fear of the Lord teaches us what? That God is wise. Right? The song we sang, trust and obey. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Why should we trust and obey? Because we know that God knows best. That's why preachers have said things like, be careful with reasoning with God's word. Obey it. Doesn't mean we don't use our brains, but remember, God is the creator of all wisdom and thinking. Be careful. And remember, can you fully understand God? No one can fully understand God outside of what He's revealed. So if we don't always understand perfectly what God has said, but the question is, do we trust? Do we trust that what He says is right? And we will see. We will see. And that's sometimes, I think, something we forget. Sometimes you have to obey before you can understand. I mean, there's things like that even growing up now that I understand better. You know, your parents or somebody else will say, you know, someday when you get older, you'll understand what I'm saying. You're like, whatever. And then you get older. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, I see what they're talking about. I see how that works. Sometimes you have to experience those things to really understand them. And here's the other aspect that certainly how the fear of the Lord then alleviates our other fears is because of this. When facing any fearful circumstance, we remember that God is bigger. Even death fears the cross. Right? There is no circumstance in life you are facing that God cannot handle or God doesn't have a purpose for. And see, so the fear of the Lord wipes away all other fears. And then when we think about, you know, when Paul talks about how love casts out fear, we understand Christ coming to our rescue, right? And how that lessens the terror fear of God, but still then calls us to be in awe of God and His riches and His mercy. And that causes us to what? Care about what God says and not what Joe Schmo says down the road. Right? We are concerned with God. And it's always easier to stand up to the big, ugly, hairy monster that smells with boogers if there's something way bigger standing behind you. And that is what God is. And so anything you face in the life, you have to understand God is behind you. And He's way bigger. So what are the characteristics then of those who practice the fear of the Lord? First is, you will not be moved. If you practice the fear of the Lord, you will remain steadfast. And so, we're going to skip down now, and we're going to pick up in verse um, 6. Alright, so we see these characteristics now. For the righteous will never, did you hear that word? Will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. Those who have the righteousness of God won't be moved. We're not talking about their own righteousness. We're talking about the righteousness you get from God. That's why I have listed there Romans 3, 21 through 22, right? For now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, right? By faith in Jesus, 
right? To all who believe, for there's no distinction. All right? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Right? That righteousness is eternal. What did Jesus tell us on the Sermon on the Mount? Right? He, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he gives that story, right, of those two builders. Right? And we got the little song, right? The wise man built his house upon the rock. You know, and then the foolish man built his house upon the sand. What's the rock? The what rock represents the words of Christ. Those eternal truths given to us by Christ. And so if our righteousness is built upon Christ, we won't be moved. We won't change our minds based on the latest news from the media. We're, we're not going to change our minds on, on what is true and what we should stand for based on circumstances. We're going to hold true. And that's going to make us timeless, and that's going to cause people to turn to the church. I mean, we've seen this, right? Politi how political movements come and go. If, if you, you Just go back to the spring when all the rioting started. There was a big push, even amongst a lot of us conservatives, to think that maybe this Black Lives Matter thing has a point, right, in the beginning. Now it's pretty obvious that they are all communists who are using who are using a position to further their own personal agenda that is just awful. But back in the beginning, that wasn't as recognizable, was it? But that's where we have to be careful as Christians, just jumping on and jumping off of movements without taking the time to sit back, assess. Now, we have to understand, you can't always tell up front, can you? Sometimes you have to wait and see. But that's where we have to be careful. If we're on solid foundation, we're not just jumping on and off of all these movements, are we? We're saying, we're stand, this is what Scripture says, this is where we stand, we'll see how this plays out before we make a decision. We are solid, we are unmovable. And this also means this, fears do not dictate your actions. Fears do not dictate your actions. You don't make decisions based on what is popular, what people think you should do, what the media says you should do, you make your decision based on God's word and his truth. And therefore, you are solid and you won't be moved off it. I always think of this idea of not being moved, because it's my mind, so I get to think how I want. <laughs> I always had, you know, the picture that always comes into my mind is the idea of an army making a stand, right? You know, those old, you know, the old cool war movies, I think they're cool, you may not, that's fine, sad for you, right? Gettysburg, right, Waterloo, um, you know, the movies they made, these, where you have a group of men, um, the last battalion, they're in their position, they have to make a stand, the enemy's coming on, and they choose to stand, right? They're going to stand no matter what. And that, I think, is a good picture of this righteous, blessed man. That no matter what is coming at him, he is going to stand firm on God's word. He's not going to move. He's not going to run. No matter how scary and bad it looks, he's going to stay here. And he's not going anywhere. So we see then, they won't be moved. Secondly, we see in verse 7... He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. All right, now notice here, it simply just says he's not afraid. doesn't say he's not saddened. doesn't say he's never frustrated. doesn't say he's never upset by bad news. doesn't say he never mourns over bad news. It just simply says he's not afraid of bad news. Well, let's face it, there's, if you want to hear some bad news, just turn on your TV set and watch the news. Right? Or just sit next to your phone long enough and one of your friends will call you and they will have bad news. And that's nothing against your friends. It's just the way life is. Life is filled with bad news. I mean, I considered it bad news when we heard Northeast was supposed to be closed for two and a half weeks. Then I heard they were coming back Monday and I thought that was good news. Right? That's, maybe that's the life of a parent. I don't know. But those are realities, right? that we have, and, and good and bad news, there's all different degrees, right? There are some bad news that think, well, that's not really something to be afraid of, but then there are other kinds of bad news that we may fear, right? Like, who wins the election? But, but, 
Notice why. Notice why this man is not afraid of bad news. Seven. His heart is firm. Okay. His heart is firm. Why is his heart firm? Trusting in the Lord. His very being, his heart, trusts God. He's not afraid because he's trusting God. And you see this really with the example of David. I use David to contrast Saul, King Saul here. When he goes out to face Goliath. You know, it's one of those passages that we always talk about. You know, David faced his giants, so you too can face your giants. And Goliath becomes this analogy for all kinds of bad things in your life. And I don't really think the text is talking about that. That's great. It makes a nice analogy. But, um, you know, the text is really talking, because here's the thing. The writer is really making this case that David should be king. Because, have you ever asked yourself, who should have fought Goliath? Who should have fought Goliath? Saul. Remember, Saul was what? Shoulder and head taller than everybody else. Saul should have been trusting in the Lord in fighting Goliath. He did not. David did. And that was really, if, I mean, you know, if you read the chapter, I mean, that's David's point. This guy is, you know, he's defying the armies of Israel. He's defying God. We can't let somebody just make fun of God like that. God will give us the victory, right? David goes out and fights Goliath. Why? Because he trusted in God. And David doesn't just go out and fight Goliath because he decided to trust God today. He trusted God when he killed the lion and when he killed the bear. So this was a recurring pattern in David's life, that when something when I'm faced with something fearful, I trust in God. And I'm sorry, but if you're out there watching sheep and you're in ancient Israel and you got a stick and you got a sling and a lion comes and, you know, you have to face down the lion and you grab it by the mane and kill it, I feel like that's somewhat of a fearful situation. Maybe you're not afraid when lions jump out of the woods, but that would be my response. Um, so we see that, right? So, so clearly David is trusted in the Lord. And that's why he's able to stand up. In fact, we see this another great example is Daniel. In the lot, well, whether it be the lion's den or whatever, right? Daniel never really seems to be too concerned about what the king thinks. He's always concerned about what God thinks. And he always makes his decision not based on what the king will do to him, but based on what God says he ought to do. Daniel always does that, and you should go back and you should read the book of Daniel, not just because it has really cool things that... Very few people seem to know what they are, if any. But because of the character of Daniel. Daniel says, I trust God, that's my decision. And so, this person's heart is what? Focused on God. And that's where I got this quote here from Jeremy Peer in his book, Dynamic Heart and Daily Life. He says, a Godward perspective <coughs> interprets an individual's life in light of the larger purpose of God in redemptive history. God is doing things in a world that was created good, has fallen into corruption, and awaits the redemption of people along with the new creation that accompanies it. Let me unpack that statement a bit further. First, God created the world and declared it good. Therefore, God's kindness and wisdom providentially directs people's circumstances. Second, man's rebellion against God corrupted the world. Therefore, people's circumstances are characterized by suffering and futility. Third, the world awaits the redemption of God's people, which means a person's circumstances serves, serve the purpose of God in preparing believers to be like Christ. Fourth, the world will be destroyed and made new, which means a person's circumstances are temporary in anticipatory of something far better. Right? We have to understand this person who trusts the Lord is understanding his life in the greater context of what God is doing. He has a Godward focus. The third character is your heart will be steady, verse 8. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. So put it this way, you won't fear your enemies. If your heart is steady, trusting in God. Sin, right? We have sin problems, right? And I don't mean fear so much in the fact that, oh, if I do this wrong, he's going to come back and bite me. 
I mean, you don't have to be afraid that sin is going to rule your spirit and your heart the rest of your life. And certainly not into eternity. That you can actually beat your sin by the mercy and grace of God. It may not be easy, it may be long, and yes, to some degree it will continue as long as you're alive. But sin does not have to be the dominating characteristic of your life. Satan, world, death, we don't have to be afraid. Why? Because Jesus already beat the enemy, right? Jesus already won. He is the bigger monster. Jesus isn't a monster, but he, the monsters are scared of Jesus. You want to know what scares the boogeyman? Jesus scares the boogeyman. All right? The victory is yours. Of course, if you look into the research about where the boogeyman comes from, you realize it's based on demonic stuff like all that other stuff. So yes, I, I'm perfectly okay saying that statement. All right. The victory is yours. So march out and take it in the so march out and take it in the name of the Lord. Now that is not usually how I talk, but I mean there is that reality, right? The victory is yours. Stop roll. Stop letting fear hinder you and go out and take it. Sometimes our fear is that we don't really want to lose our sin. We like the comfort it gives us, so we hold on to it instead of giving it up. Our problem isn't so much that we, that we don't know we can have victory, we don't really want to. And that's not a good place to be. Now, one thing we see here, as I've mentioned throughout, eternal truths. Right? All this, this blessed man who is not, who, who's not afraid, who does not waver, he, he rests his hope on eternal truths of Scripture and on the eternal truth of Christ. Okay? That's very important you get. These things are eternal, they last forever because God is eternal and they stem from God. Now, we have to understand something that, of this, and that is the idea of an eternal God goes against the world. It goes against the world. It goes against the flow of things. Because notice verse 10. The wicked man sees it and is angry. So the wicked man sees this blessed man who's not afraid, who isn't moved, who stands on God's word and the eternal truth, and he doesn't say, boy, that's a great idea. I should be like him. He's angry. He's angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. But notice he doesn't last, does he? The wicked is forgotten. The wicked fails. Now I want to, this is a quote I got from the Communist Manifesto. Alright? I just want to show you that there are many in this world who want to destroy these eternal truths. Marx said, undoubtedly it will be said religious, moral, philosophical, and juridical ideas have been modified in the course of historical development. But religion, morality, philosophy, political science, and law constantly survive the change. And he, as you'll see in the next paragraph, says it with a little bit of frustration. All right, so what he's saying is, throughout the course of human history, these things, they may change in form and how they're applied, but essentially they stay the same. They are never gotten rid of when society changes. And Marx thinks that's a bad thing. And we're going to see that in our next quote from Marx. There are, besides eternal truth, such as freedom and justice, notice what he called them. He called them eternal truths. Freedom and justice that are common to all states of society. But communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality. Instead of constituting them on a new basis, it therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. Understand what he is saying. First off, he actually acknowledges that these things are part of human nature. Right? The Apostle Paul says, even the things about God's Godhead can be known through creation. But what does Mark say? Even, those things are, even though these things are embedded in human character, <coughs> I want to completely abolish them all. That's my goal. No religion, no morality, no freedom, no justice, just get rid of all of it. And then we will have a perfect society. 
Who do you think he's aiming that at? He's aiming that at God because God is eternal and his truths are eternal. Don't be fooled and don't believe any socialist, communist, Marxist, especially one that even says they're Marxist when they say, oh, I am all for justice. That is baloney. And that is a lie and they know they're lying because they don't believe in morals. They say they want to get rid of morals, so why would you believe anything they have to say? And understand, it's not going to be pushed in your face. Hey, we're communists. We want to get rid of everything you love. They're not going to come out and say that. You wouldn't. And they have no conviction to do it. Because, again, they want to get rid of what? Morality. But here's the thing. We don't have to fear even this. Because our God is eternal, and His eternal truths were, are what? Eternal. You can't obliterate eternal truths. It can't be done. So remember, we serve a eternal God. Take home. So, three characteristics that will be true of you if you fear the Lord. You will not be moved. You will not be afraid of bad news. And your heart will be steady. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you. Lord, that the enemy won't move us, Father God, that you have a place prepared for us, Lord. Father God, help us to be faithful and give us that faith to trust in you. And we just pray in these things, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, all who are able, stand, turn your hymnals, and we have a treat for you today as we finish. Seth is going to play his trumpet a little bit while we sing. I don't know if Bruce can explain how that's going to work.